Chapter One, Book One of Rookwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Paul Curran. Rookwood, Book One The Wedding Ring. It has been observed and I am apt to believe it is an observation which will generally be found true, that before a terrible truth comes to light, there are certain murmuring whispers fly before it, and prepare the minds of men for the reception of the truth itself. Gallic Reports Case of the Count saint Girin. Chapter 1. The Vault Let me know, therefore, fully the intent of this thy dismal preparation, this talk fit for a charnel. Webster. Within a sepulchral vault, and at midnight, two persons were seated. The chamber was of singular construction and considerable extent. The roof was of solid stone masonry, and rose in a wide semicircular arch to the height of about seventeen feet, measured from the centre of the ceiling to the ground floor while the sides were divided by slight partition walls into ranges of low, narrow catacombs. The entrance to each cavity was surrounded by an obtusely pointed arch, resting upon slender granite pillars, and the intervening space was filled with a variety of tablets, escutcheons, shields, and inscriptions, recording the titles and heraldic honours of the departed. There were no doors to the niches, and within might be seen piles of coffins packed one upon another, till the floor groaned with the weight of lead. Against one of the pillars upon a hook hung a rack of tattered time-out-of-mind hatchments, and in the centre of the tomb might be seen the effigies of Sir Ranulph de Rookwood, the builder of the mausoleum, and the founder of the race who slept within its walls. This statue, wrought in black marble, differed from most monumental carved work, in that its posture was erect and lifelike. Sir Ranulph was represented as sheathed in a complete suit of mail, decorated with his emblazoned and gilded surcoat, his arm leaning upon the pommel of a weighty kirtle axe. The attitude was that of stern repose. A conically formed helmet rested upon the brow. The beaver was raised, and revealed harsh but commanding features, the golden spur of knighthood was fixed upon the heel, and at the feet, enshrined in a costly sarcophagus of marble, dug from the same quarry as the statue, rested the mortal remains of one of the sternest knights to his mortal foe that ever put spear in the rest. Streaming in a wavering line upon the roof, the sickly flame of a candle partially fell upon the human figures before alluded to, throwing them into darkest relief and casting their opaque and fantastical shadows along the ground. An old coffin upon a bier, we have said, served the mysterious twain for a seat. Between them stood a bottle and a glass. Evidence is that, whatever might be the ulterior object of their stealthy communion, the immediate comfort of the creature had not altogether been overlooked. At the feet of one of the personages were laid a mattock, a horned lantern, from which the candle had been removed, a crowbar, and a bunch of keys. Near to these implements, of a vocation which the reader will readily surmise, rested a strange superannuated terrier, with wiry back and frosted muzzle, a head minus an ear, and a leg wanting a paw. His master, for such we shall suppose him, was an old man with a lofty forehead, covered with a singularly shaped nightcap, and clothed, as to his lower limbs, with tight ribbed grey worsted hose ascending externally after a bygone fashion considerably above the knee the old man's elbow rested upon the handle of his spade his wrists supported his chin and his grey glassy eyes glimmering like marsh meteors in the candlelight were fixed upon his companion with a glance of searching scrutiny the object of his investigation a much more youthful and interesting person seemed lost in reverie, and alike insensible to time, place, and the object of the meeting. With both hands grasped around the barrel of a fowling-piece, 
and his face leaning upon the same support, the features were entirely concealed from view, the light, too, being at the back, and shedding its rays over, rather than upon his person, aided his disguise. Yet, even thus imperfectly defined, the outline of the head and the proportions of the figure were eminently striking and symmetrical. Attired in a rough forester's costume of the mode of 1737, and of the roughest texture and rudest make, his wild garb would have determined his rank as sufficiently humble in the scale of society, had not a certain loftiness of manner, and bold though reckless deportment, argued pretensions on the part of the wearer to a more elevated station in life, and contradicted, in a great measure, the impression produced by the homely appearance of his habiliments. A cap of shaggy brown fur, fancifully but not ungracefully fashioned, covered his head, from beneath which, dropping in natural clusters over his neck and shoulders, a cloud of raven hair escaped. Subsequently, when his face was more fully revealed, it proved to be that of a young man of dark aspect and grave, melancholy expression of countenance, approaching even to the stern when at rest, though sufficiently animated and earnest when engaged in conversation or otherwise excited. His features were regular, delicately formed, and might be characterised as singularly handsome, were it not for a want of roundness in the contour of the face, which gave the lineaments a thin, worn look, totally distinct, however, from haggardness or emaciation. The nose was delicate and fine, the nostril especially so. The upper lip was short, curling, graceful, and haughtily expressive. As to complexion, his skin had a truly Spanish warmth and intensity of colouring. His figure, when raised, was tall and masculine, and though slight, exhibited a great personal vigour. We will now turn to his companion, the old man with the great grey glittering eyes. Peter Bradley of Rookwood, Comitatu Ibor, where he had exercised the vocation of sexton for the best part of a life already drawn out to the full span ordinarily allotted to mortality, was an odd caricature of humanity. His figure was lean, and almost as lank as a skeleton. His bald head reminded one of a bleached skull, allowing for the overhanging and hoary brows. Deep-seated and sunken within their sockets, his grey orbs gleamed with intolerable lustre. Few could endure his gaze, and, aware of his power, Peter seldom failed to exercise it. He had, likewise, another habit which, as it savoured of insanity, made him an object of commiseration with some, while it rendered him yet more obnoxious to others. The habit we allude to was the indulgence of wild, screaming laughter, at times when all merriment should be checked, and when the exhibition of levity must proceed from utter disregard of human grief and suffering, or from mental alienation. Wearied with the prolonged silence, Peter at length condescended to speak. His voice was harsh and grating as a rusty hinge. "'Another glass,' said he, pouring out a modicum of the pale fluid. His companion shook his head. "'It will keep out the cold,' continued the sexton, pressing the liquid upon him. "'And you, who are not so much accustomed as I am to the damps of a vault, may suffer from them. Besides, added he sneeringly, it will give you courage. His companion answered not, but the flash of his eye resented the implied reproach. Nay, never stare at me so hard, Luke, continued the sexton. I doubt neither your courage nor your firmness. But if you won't drink, I will. Here's to the rest eternal of Sir Piers Rookwood, You'll say amen to that pledge, or you're neither grandson of mine, nor offspring of his loins. Why should I reverence his memory? answered Luke, bitterly, refusing the proffered potion. Who showed no fatherly love for me? He disowned me in life, in death. I disowned him. Sir Piers Rookwood was no father of mine. He was as certainly a father. As Susan Bradley, your mother, was my daughter, rejoined the sexton. "'And surely,' cried Luke, impetuously, "'you need not boast of the connection. "'Tis not for you, old man, to couple their names together, "'to exult in your daughter's disgrace and your own dishonour. "'Shame! Shame! Speak not of them in the same breath. 
if you would not have me invoke curses on the dead, I have no reverence, whatever you may have, for the seducer, for the murderer of my mother. "'You have choice store of epithets in sooth, young grandson,' rejoined Peter, with a chuckling laugh. "'Sir Piers, a murderer!' "'Tush!' exclaimed Luke indignantly. "'Affect not ignorance. "'You have better knowledge than I have of the truth or falsehood of the dark tale "'that has gone abroad respecting my mother's fate. "'And unless report has belied you foully, "'had substantial reasons for keeping sealed lips on the occasion. "'But to change this painful subject,' added he, with a sudden alteration of manner, "'at what hour did Sir Piers Rookwood die?' "'On Thursday last, in the night-time. "'The exact hour I know not,' replied the sexton. "'Of what ailment?' "'Neither do I know that. "'His end was sudden, yet not without a warning sign.' "'What warning?' inquired Luke. "'Neither more nor less than the death-omen of the house. "'You look astonished. "'Is it possible you have never heard of the ominous lime-tree and the fatal bough? "'Why?' "'Tis a common tale hereabouts, and has been for centuries. "'Any old crone would tell it you. "'Peradventure, you have seen the old avenue of lime-trees leading to the hall, "'nearly a quarter of a mile in length, "'and as noble a row of timber as any in the west riding of Yorkshire. "'Well, there is one tree, the last on the left hand before you come to the clock-house, "'larger than all the rest, a huge piece of timber, "'with broad spreading branches, and of I know not what girth in the trunk. "'That tree is—' in some mysterious manner, connected with the family of Rookwood, and immediately previous to the death of one of that line, a branch is sure to be shed from the parent stem, prognosticating his doom. But you shall hear the legend. And in a strange, sepulchral tone, not inappropriate, however, to his subject, Peter chanted the following ballad. The Legend of the Lime Tree Amid the grove, or arched above, with lime-trees old and tall, the avenue that leads unto the Rookwood's ancient hall, high o'er the rest its towering crest one tree rears to the sky, and wide out flings like mighty wings its arms umbrageously. Seven yards its base would scarce embrace, a goodly tree I ween, with silver bark and foliage dark of melancholy green and mid its boughs two ravens house, and build from year to year their black brood hatch, their black brood watch, then screaming disappear. In that old tree, when playfully the summer breezes sigh, its leaves are stirred, and there is heard a low and plaintive cry, and when in shrieks the storm blast speaks, its reverend boughs among, sad wailing moans like human groans, the concert harsh prolong. But whether gale or calm prevail, or threatening cloud hath fled, by hand of fate predestinate, a limb that tree will shed. A verdant bough, untouched I trow by axe or tempest's breath, to Rookwood's head an omen dread of fast approaching death. Some think that tree instinct must be with preternatural power, like larum bell death's note to knell at fate's appointed hour while some avow that on its bough are fearful traces seen, red as the stains from human veins commingling with the green. Others again there are maintain that on the shattered bark a print is made, where fiends have laid their scathing talons dark, that, ere it falls, the raven calls thrice from that wizard bough, and that each cry doth signify what space the fates allow, in olden days, the legend says, as grim Sir Ranulph viewed, a wretched hag her footsteps dragged beneath his lordly wood. His bloodhounds twain he called amain, and straightway gave her chase, was never seen in forest green, so fierce, so fleet a race. With eyes aflame to Ranulph came each red and ruthless hound, while mangled, torn, a sight forlorn, the hag lay on the ground. In where she lay was turned the clay, and limb and reeking bone, within the earth with ribald mirth by Ranulph grim were thrown. And while as yet the soil was wet with that poor witch's gore, a lime-tree stake 
did Ranulph take, and pierced her bosom's core. And strange to tell what next befell, that branch at once took root, and richly fared within its bed strong suckers forth did shoot. From year to year fresh boughs appear, it waxes huge in size, and with wild glee this prodigy Sir Ranulph grim espies. One day when he, beneath that tree, reclined in joy and pride, a branch was found upon the ground, the next Sir Ranulph died. And from that hour a fatal power has ruled that wizard tree, to Ranulph's line a warning sign of doom and destiny. For when a bough is found, I trow beneath its shade to lie, ere sun shall rise thrice in the skies, a rookwood sure shall die. And such an omen preceded Sir Piers' demise, said Luke, who had listened with some attention to his grandsire's song. Unquestionably, replied the sexton. Not longer ago than Tuesday morning, I happened to be sauntering down the avenue I have just described. I know not what took me thither at that early hour, but I wandered leisurely on till I came nigh the wizard lime tree. Great heaven, what a surprise awaited me! A huge branch lay right across the path. It had evidently just fallen, for the leaves were green and unwithered. The sap still oozed from the splintered wood, and there was neither trace of knife nor hatchet on the bark. I looked up among the boughs to mark the spot from whence it had been torn by the hand of fate, for no human hand had done it, and saw the pair of ancestral ravens perched amid the foliage, and croaking as those carrion fowl are wont to do when they scent a carcass afar off. Just then, a livelier sound saluted my ears. A cheering cry of a pack of hounds resounded from the courts, and the great gates being thrown open, out issued Sir Piers, attended by a troop of his roistering companions, all on horseback, and all making the welkin ring with their vociferations. Sir Piers laughed as loudly as the rest, but his mirth was speedily checked. No sooner had his horse, old Rook, his favourite steed, who never swerved at stake or pale before, set eyes upon the accursed branch, than he started as if the fiend stood before him, and rearing backwards flung his rider from the saddle. At this moment, with loud screams, the wizard ravens took flight. Sir Piers was somewhat hurt by the fall, but he was more frightened than hurt, and though he tried to put a bold face on the matter, it was plain that his efforts to recover himself were fruitless. Dr. Titus Turconnell and that wild fellow Jack Palmer, who has lately come to the hall, and of whom you know something, tried to rally him, but it would not do. He broke up the day's sport, and returned dejectedly to the hall. Before departing, however, he addressed a word to me in private, respecting you, and pointed with a melancholy shake of the head to the fatal branch. "'It is my death warrant,' said he gloomily. And so it proved. Two days afterwards his doom was accomplished. "'And do you place faith in this idle legend?' asked Luke, with affected indifference although it was evident from his manner that he himself was not so entirely free from a superstitious feeling of credulity as he would have it appear. Certes, replied the sexton, I were more difficult to be convinced than the unbelieving disciple else. Thrice hath it occurred to my own knowledge, and ever with the same result, first with Sir Reginald, secondly with thy own mother, and lastly, as I have just told thee, with Sir Piers. I thought you said, even now, that this death omen, if such it be, was always confined to the immediate family of Rookwood, and not to mere inmates of the mansion. To the heads only of that house, be they male or female. Then how could it apply to my mother? Was she of that house? Was she a wife? Who shall say she was not? rejoined the sexton. Who shall say she was so? replied Luke, repeating the words with indignant emphasis. Who will avouch that? A smile, cold as a wintry sunbeam, played upon the sexton's rigid lips. "'I will bear this no longer,' cried Luke. "'Anger me not. I'll look to yourself. In a word, have you anything to tell me respecting her? If not, let me be gone.' "'I have. But I will not be hurried by a boy like you,' replied Peter doggedly. "'Go, if you will, and take the consequences. My lips are sealed forever, and I have much to say.' 
much that it behoves you to know. Be brief, then. When you sought me out this morning in my retreat with the gypsy gang at Davenham Wood, you bade me meet you in the porch of Rookwood Church at midnight. I was true to my appointment. And I will keep my promise, replied the sexton. Draw closer, that I may whisper in thine ear, of every Rookwood who lies around us, and all that ever bore the name, except Sir Pierce himself, who lies in state in the hall, are here, not one, mark what I say, not one male branch of the house but has been suspected. Of what? Of murder, returned the sexton in a hissing whisper. Murder? echoed Luke, recoiling. There is one dark stain, one foul blot on all. Blood. Blood hath been spilt. By all? Ay, and such blood. Theirs was no common crime. Even murder hath its degrees. Theirs was of the first class. Their wives? You cannot mean that. Ay, their wives. I do. You have heard it, then. Ha! It is a trick they had. Did you ever hear the old saying? No mate ever brook wood, a rook of the rook wood. A merry saying it is, and true. No woman ever stood in a rookwood's way, but she was speedily removed, that's certain. They had all, save poor Sir Piers, the knack of stopping a troublesome woman's tongue, and practised it to perfection. A rare art, eh? What have the misdeeds of his ancestry to do with Sir Piers? muttered Luke much less with my mother. Everything. If he could not rid himself of his wife, and she is a match for the devil himself, the mistress might be more readily set aside. Have you absolute knowledge of aught? asked Luke, his voice tremulous with emotion. Nay, I but hinted. Such hints are worse than open speech. Let me know the worst. Did he kill her? And Luke glared at the sexton as if he would have penetrated his secret soul. But Peter was not so easily fathomed. His cold, bright eye returned Luke's gaze steadfastly, as he answered composedly, I have said all I know, but not all you think. Thoughts should not always find utterance, else we might often endanger our own safety and that of others. An idle subterfuge, and from you worse than idle, I will have my answer, yea or nay. Was it poison? Was it steel? Enough. She died. No, it is not enough. When? Where? In her sleep. In her bed. Why? That was natural. A wrinkling smile crossed the sexton's brow. What means that horrible gleam of laughter? exclaimed Luke, grasping the shoulder of the man of graves with such force as to nearly annihilate him. Speak! or I will strangle you. She died, you say, in her sleep. She did so, replied the sexton, shaking off Luke's hold. And was it to tell me that I had a mother's murder to avenge, that you brought me to the tomb of her destroyer, when he is beyond the reach of my vengeance? Luke exhibited so much frantic violence of manner and gesture, that the sexton entertained some little apprehension that his intellects were unsettled by the shock of the intelligence. It was, therefore, in what he intended for a soothing tone that he attempted to solicit his grandson's attention. "'I will hear nothing more,' interrupted Luke, and the vaulted chamber rang with his passionate lamentations. "'Am I the sport of this mocking fiend?' cried he, "'to whom my agony is derision, my despair a source of enjoyment, beneath whose withering glance my spirit shrinks, who, with half-expressed insinuations, tortures my soul, awakening fancies that goad me on to dark and desperate deeds?' Dead mother, upon thee I call, if in thy grave thou canst hear the cry of thy most wretched son yearning to avenge thee, answer me, if thou hast the power, let me have some token of the truth or falsity of these wild suppositions, that I may wrestle against the demon. But no, added he, in accents of despair, no ear listens to me, save his to whom my wretchedness is food for mockery. Could the dead hear thee? thy mother might do so, returned the sexton. She lies within this space. Luke staggered back, as if struck by a sudden shot. He spoke not, but fell with a violent shock against a pile of coffins, at which he caught for support. What have I done? he exclaimed, recoiling. 
a thundering crash resounded through the vault. One of the coffins, dislodged from its position by his fall, tumbled to the ground, and alighting upon its side, split asunder. "'Great heavens, what's this?' cried Luke, as a dead body, clothed in all the hideous apparel of the tomb, rolled forth to his feet. "'It is your mother's corpse,' answered the sexton coldly. "'I brought you hither to behold it, but you have anticipated my intentions.' "'This? My mother?' shrieked Luke, dropping upon his knees by the body and seizing one of its chilly hands as it lay upon the floor with the face upwards. The sexton took the candle from the sconce. "'Can this be death?' shouted Luke. "'Impossible! Oh, God, she stirs! She moves! The light! Quick! I see her stir! This is dreadful!' "'Do not deceive yourself,' said the sexton, in a tone which betrayed more emotion than was his wont. "'Tis the bewilderment of fancy. "'She will never stir again.' "'And he shaded the candle with his hand, "'so as to throw the full light upon the face of the corpse. "'It was motionless, as that of an image carved in stone. "'No trace of corruption was visible upon the rigid, "'yet exquisite tracery of its features. "'A profuse cloud of raven hair escaped from its swathements in the fall, hung like a dark veil over the bosom and person of the dead, and presented a startling contrast to the wax-like hue of the skin and the pallid seer-clothes. Flesh still adhered to the hand, though it was moulded into dust within the grip of Luke, as he pressed the fingers to his lips. The shroud was disposed like night-gear about her person, and from without its folds a few withered flowers had fallen. A strong aromatic odour of a pungent nature was diffused around, giving evidence that the art by which the ancient Egyptians endeavoured to rescue their kindred from decomposition had been resorted to, to preserve the fleeting charms of the unfortunate Susan Bradley. A pause of awful silence succeeded, broken only by the convulsive respiration of Luke. The sexton stood by, apparently an indifferent spectator of the scene of horror. His eye wandered from the dead to the living, and gleamed with a peculiar and indefinable expression, half apathy, half abstraction. For one single instant, as he scrutinized the features of his daughter, his brow, contracted by anger, immediately afterwards was elevated in scorn. But otherwise you would have sought in vain to read the purport of that cold, insensible glance which dwelt for a brief space on the face of the mother, and settled eventually upon her son. At length, the withered flowers attracted his attention. He stooped to pick up one of them. "'Faded as the hand that gathered ye, as the bosom on which ye were strewn,' he murmured. "'No sweet smell left.' Holding the dry leaves to the flame of the candle, they were instantly ignited, and the momentary brilliance played like a smile upon the features of the dead. Peter observed the effect. "'Such was thy life!' he exclaimed. "'A brief, bright sparkle followed by dark, utter extinction.' Saying which, he flung the expiring ashes of the floweret from his hand. End of chapter 1, book 1